Hadi is an associate professor at uh, civil engineering and a lecturer on reservoir, I have to read this, simulation and rock fluid physics at the Faculty of uh, Civil Engineering and Geosciences. And as I said before, he's just been elected as um, Deudel's most innovative teaching talent. And I guess you're going to explain to us why this happened and what your ideas about teaching are. And uh, especially, how do we have to organize our uh, teaching environment to make our students flourish? Thank you very yours. much. Thank you very much, uh, Anushka. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Well, the award is already given, so if I do not present a, a good speech today, I already have the award in my office, so that's uh, to uh, lower the pressure on me today. Uh, I would like to start my lecture by asking you a very simple question. How many of you are old enough to recognize some photo like this? How many of you have seen a winter in your lifetime? Many, many of you. And actually, this is actually the case that whenever we witness things and we engage and communicate or contribute, these two things are quite different. I've seen many, many winters in my life, but last winter was very, very different to me. Last year, uh, we had to do some uh, planting in our garden, in the, our you know, house. And I had a gardener to help me with, with this job. And then I had a very dead looking dry plant in my hands. And Frank, my uh, gardener and good friend, he helped me you know, just put it in the soil of my garden. So we planted this plant in my garden. It was winter and something like this. Soon after, it was a spring. And I was in my garden, I could not believe the same plant that I had just three, four months ago had turned into a green, happy flower. The very same plant that might have looked like, like this in the winter time. So then, these are the moments in life that some sort of aha happens to us, or, well, that's funny because you just have been engaged instead of just witnessing the garden and forest and woods in the nature. This is something you have done yourself. And that makes you somehow think that isn't it what we want to do with education? Isn't it the purpose of what we want to actually get surprised from people who come here and stay four, five, six years of the best moment of their life with us and at the end they would like to flourish, to be happy, productive, green, and lively. See them like these kind of trees that would produce lots of solutions, lots of products to the society whenever or wherever they are placed to. Instead of looking at the trees, or instead of looking at trees, you could have watched too much or focused too much on the apple here, on this plot. And the apples, we know that they maximum they can survive for a couple of days. Lifelong learning cannot be an apple. It cannot be the solution. It cannot be the knowledge you transfer. It should be something to do with the tree, to give birth, to develop, or to growth. And this is the change of the focus I would like to introduce today in my lecture today. So then, all of us would like to have our students flourish. This is the common objective all of us have. And so the question is always, how do we answer this question? How do we make them flourish? How do we develop professionals? Classically, what we do is, well, this is a nice garden. I'd like to have it in my backyard as well. But it's not my backyard garden, by the way. Uh, I wish it was. So to make them flourish, what we do is we offer lectures and courses. We offer plenty courses on fascinating scientific subjects, whether it is at chemical engineering, whether it is at civil engineering, geosciences, electrical engineering, TBM, policy management, and everything that we do. We offer courses, and then we try to see students coming, perhaps not so sure about the content of what we offer, and through the course, they flourish. It seems as if we take students and plant them 
in our courses and expect our courses will let them flourish. We'll make them lively, happy professionals for life. So if we care too much about our education and teaching, like many of us do, we design a lot of activities to make our course look like a, a club of inspiration. We drop lots of apples on the students' heads, and we hope that through the course of our lecture, they come up with an aha moment. And they are happy and flourishing at the end of our lecture. This is what we actually focus too much on this course view. We focus development of our students mainly on the courses we offer, but we know that the garden is green, not just because of the soil. Soil is of course important, it provides nutrition. They are very, very uh, critical to any development, but it is not enough. So what else could it be so that you see such a green garden? The tree that would stay productive for life. And we know that this garden is green, not just because of the soil, but because of the environment. And the environment can't be seen as one isolated module, either course or anything isolated and individual that we perform. It has components, and it should have harmony and balance and synchronization between them. If I have one of them just very nice, I put more fertilizer in my course, so I offer better course, better, 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 but I'm not providing enough air, sun, I don't have a good garden. So maybe we should just shift our priority and see how can we really develop better students rather than how can we develop better courses. That's my message today. Because objective is having the student ready at the end of the cycle of education here in university to pick up a good role in the society after graduation. That's what we license our students for. We offer a diploma. So that's very important. And they come with this expectation as well. So what is this teaching environment? I think, and I may be wrong because we are all researchers and scientists, this is what I think that this garden is green, or we can achieve this healthy, productive, lifelong lasting environment by three components at minimum. We need courses to offer nutrition to our garden. We need course, we need science. There is no doubt that teaching courses offers a lot of opportunities and very big foundation of this whole environmental diagram, if you wish to call. Another aspect is the research. In fact, many of us offer license, master degree, diploma, or especially PhD as well, whenever someone has conducted a good quality research. So research is extremely important and complementary to course. And the last thing that provides another access for development and growth is the community. The environment will be complete or in synchrony or harmony if we have course, research, and community as well. And all of them are kind of balanced and they are paid attention to in the right way and a bit flexible with respect to the different tastes of each student. The good thing about environment is if you have a student who has a different, you know, individuals have different passions, they have different wishes, different different wills. We can't just categorize them into one specific subject. We can just provide good environment and let apple, pear, peach, and other type of taste and flowers just flourish. Our job will be just to pro provide a good environment for let them be the way they want to be. That's the message. So I'm gonna go through my experience in what I have done in the course, research and community, and share with you transparently and honestly what, what is it that I have done. And I've, maybe I have done lots of things you know, not complete, or you could have done it a lot better, or maybe you are already doing it better. I would be pleased to hear from you so that we just communicate and see what else we could perhaps do. With the course, the courses that Anushka just mentioned that I offer are about mainly about uh, physics of flow in porous medium, and about simulation, numerical methods and development of numerical schemes. So some 
kind of abstract science. So keep that in mind. But one important thing that before going to this experience sharing with you is that I would like to also uh, summarize this whole scheme as to me, to make this students flourish is not to make them learn new subjects or have more knowledge. Now I could ask you one simple question as well, like the first question, how many of you would have get, got the same grade for a course you had about 10 years ago if I would have distributed the papers today to you. Pick up a course you have had 10 years ago. How many of you could get the same grade? Well, there are some, some very talented scientists here. I, I don't dare to ask all of you that question, but if I am one of a kind of a mod, you know, sample, after your course in about maybe two weeks, the students may not even recognize how you look like. Maybe. I hope that it's not the case, but maybe. So then how is it that this lifelong learning should depend only on the course? How could it be? We don't even, we ourselves don't remember what happened in those courses. We have had plenty of them in our lifetime. So to me, to flourish is not to learn, but to become. We become better, happier, more professional graduates or scientists or researchers or human beings in general. It's about four years of a student's lifetime. They come, they experience us, they get some nutrition, some research, some build up the community, friendship, and they leave. And that's part of their life. And they should just feel that they are better people. They can communicate, they can understand, they can synthesize, they can innovate better. That's our, our role here. The rest is just tool. So let's look at the courses I offer. What I have done that a lot of you could do a lot better and already are doing a lot better. I appreciate that as well, but this is my time to speak, so I'm sorry to do that from my side. What is the philosophy of what I do as teaching is let them experience the science. And I'm sure it's not that easy, especially for abstract courses, but that's my, the, the thing that takes most, most of my time to design a course is usually when I spend a lot of time in my office and think, how could they experience this? So I wanted to teach this year conduction and convection in porous medium. And then I had a lot of discussions with a lot of colleagues of mine as well, and myself also thinking, how could they just do it instead of just having the formula of convection, conduction, the ratio, Peckler number, what's the convection dominated, conduction dominated, and so on. And then I thought that, well, if I buy 60 thermometers and I put some sand in a kind of a syringe, I will have a porous medium already. So this is the, my, a lot of part of my courses are actually centered around this object. So I carry them always in my backpack. So I checked in when I'm flying somewhere or so, just it's been safe so far. So I put soil in here and that becomes a porous sample. And you can start from Navier Stokes and get a lot of properties of physics of fluid in this. If you just add some water, I actually have some. If you add this water in here, now, if I let this go, this is actually, if it goes, well, it's at the beginning, it's starting to wet, to make the porous sample wet, and then it starts to drop, 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 drop. And I could have, you know, made 20 hours lecture about this, but I make it five minutes. And then I go, and these are the students who are actually doing this in the class. Now, here you go, it starts. It's science, it's practicing, it's affordable, which means you can do it in your kitchen, in your backyard garden. If you can take the science with you and experience it, you learn it. So that's what I do also for the computer pr programming and simulation courses as well, which means, you know, we do a lot of scientific development about methods for discretization of partial differential equations and simulation of particles, fluid flow, and all the kind of things, but the better way to teach it is you just give the concept and just connect your own laptop and start coding with your students. Let them just do what they are hearing. And then you correct as they are doing. So in fact, in very abstract courses, you can think of a lot of ways that you could engage students to practice the science in an affordable manner. And nowadays they can bring even their own laptops with themselves. So it's not necessary to book a large computer room. So that's course, and it's very brief, I wanted to mention. About the research, 
you complement the teaching and courses that you offer in university by asking a student to be coached by a professional and do the research, so the person should do research. Oftentimes I answer this question, that what's the research difference between university and industry? I've had industry also experience in my life. I think the main difference between the research we do in university and in companies that in university, professionals avoid doing research themselves. We teach people and train them to do research. It could have taken a lot faster for you if you would have done it yourself, but that's not the main reason here that we are educators. We need to teach people to do research rather than doing it ourselves all the time. So they do the things, and then you help them provide capacity, learn how to, how to understand a big problem, the significance of a big problem. That develops their capacity and how to divide a complex problem into logically connected pieces. And then try to provide solution, connect, relate, and very importantly, to communicate and transfer the science that they have developed. So for that, I have a research group, and many of you have research groups as well, but that's very important to actually uh, notice that this is a big part of what, what we are doing in in university and provides a good and healthy uh, environmental component to this, to this whole framework. Last but not least, and definitely not least, and this is what the core of my, my message today is about, is about development of community. Community in one word is we the word. As you are not a random particle that moves with Brownian motion. You've got purpose to move, and you feel the forces and the, and the energy from all other human beings around you. And the community, I would like to focus a bit more on this and close my talk. What do I mean by this development of community? Community is a group of people who share concerns, who complement each other. In a group, they are less defeatable, or they are feeling more complete. They feel they're missing gaps. It builds friendship and it can, you know, uh, uh, guarantees also lifelong learning as well. Imagine we have a good teaching club here with all the educators. This is a kind of a community that, that we are developing, for example. There are some tips I want to exp explain to or, or share with you from my own experience in development of the research group that is called DAR Sim Delft Advanced Reservoir Simulation. The first tip that I would like to uh, give to my, my uh, fellow, my junior, like me, junior faculty and academics is that always think about building a group around you. And don't interact individually, individually and so. I know a lot of uh, uh, senior colleagues are sitting here and they are already uh, familiar with all these concepts. It's just more because it's been also uh, recorded, I hope, some young person like myself who comes and takes an academic position, and if the stochastic, I don't know, some by chance watches this video later, see that this community and group building is very important in my view. It makes the people, and you can cluster them with different size of people, from bachelor, master, and postdocs, and PhD, and you can start with, with many, you know, few. If there is a purpose, you can grow. If not, don't. It was actually recently, a few months ago, uh, an article in Nature about what the size of a group should be. And they have studied many, many uh, at University of Chicago and, and University of Santa Fe that sometimes the smaller groups are more innovative than larger groups. So it's not really, really the matter. The size, quantity, and all the kind of things don't pay attention to. Have a group and give identity. And very important, a very important thing here is it should be centered around a top science subject. That will make you famous. And that gives people in your group also identity. Connect to the world, that's very important. And you must be, in that case, very global as well. So you should be the person who knows what the globe looks like and how are you going to connect with people around the world. You send your people there, you host people here, and you host events, and you participate and lead events as well. There are big conferences around your subject of community building and group leading. You need to be there as the organizer, as the chair, as the lead. One important thing here is that the focus of this community build-up is they. 
is for the students. So we organize lots of seminars, lots of events in the university, and we expect our own colleagues who are busier than us show up and attend. And I think that's maybe not correct. If you just open it up to the university students, so you invite your students to attend and provide these sort of things only for students, and you will see 10, 20 colleagues will show up, but you see 50 students will show up. And this is all about them, not for you. It's about them. So host them and do things and events for them. That's very important. And there was one item up there that I missed to uh, fully uh, explain, that one in the top, is that this is important to build an alumnus or alumni group. When you enter this group and you stay for some years with us and do research, you don't, you don't exit. You take another position after graduation. You become a professional, either a professor or a, a researcher in industry, or maybe a governor or somewhere, politician, or whatever. You stay connected with us. You still belong to this group. And that's important that alumni get connected always with your current students as well. And they form one group. I have one group in WhatsApp, and all of my students, including alumni, except two of them so far, the two that got PhD just long ago, uh, are connected, all of them, and they are, they are everywhere, from Switzerland, from America, from Britain, from everywhere. And they are graduates of our own group, and they stay connected. If they see some opportunities, some hiring, some grants, some funding, it's just, this is lifelong. But the course is over. The research, the diploma is over, but this is about some years that we are doing this practice. So our friendship never ends, or our, our alumni group. This is very, very important to keep your contacts always with you. And get funds to my, to my colleagues, to my junior colleagues, that you, have, you, know, you, you need to appreciate the fact that when you are independent financially from your section, from your department, from your faculty about things you would like to do, events, workshop, seminar, sending a student out in, this costs money. And so that's why you need to be good in teaching and research. You should get money there and feed it to your education and vice versa. They're not separate. So I've used a lot also the, the money that I could get from fundings for research and so we deliver. There are money left. You can send your students to best university outside or to industry or they come here and you invest here. You need this. I mean, otherwise the department heads would get lots of lots of kind of requests for all the kind of things. So if you have independency on that subject, it, it makes you a lot more flexible. And that was one thing I tried to do as well. For all the events I have hosted so far in the university, I costed my section zero euro for the past six years. So you should find some things from somewhere, and that's important as well. And this is very honest. Uh, it's being recorded as good as it's been recorded because I like this to be recorded. Find one way that things can be done. There are hundred ways that it cannot be done. And I've gone through all the hard hardness of this sort of conversations, either with HR, with your manager, with this and that, that things cannot be done. But if you're an academics, you should find one way that it can be done. And usually it helps a lot. So be prepared that if you want to organize something or you want to build this, there are so many things that, oh, because the students are busy, they have lectures, we cannot spend money on this and that, and so many things that would make you uh, say that oh, it's a lot of work, forget about it. But find one way always. Find one way that the thing you want to do can work. And that's enough, because there is only one way and that's fine. And last is to spend time for yourself. My advice to my uh, age or my uh, stage uh, academic friends is that take a mentor and don't, don't just, that, that's fine. And it's always good to have other people to connect with you and also spend some time for yourself. There is no one perfect, but you can f select four or five people who would advise you on how you improve your course, how you improve your research, how do you deal with bureaucracy better. So find people who would mentor you and yourself belong to also another being educated or trained or flourishing club or community as well. 
This is extremely important for us also. We think that when we are head of the lab or when we are doing some research courses and so on, we know everything. And no, there are things that we can learn. And then we can communicate and we can get in touch and say, well, do you have five minutes? Actually, I have a problem with my student and that's the problem. What do you think I should do? This getting mentorship and spending time for yourself, I think is very crucial. And it has been crucial for me. And I've selected my mentors internationally. I didn't just look into Delft, but I had in Delft also and other places as well. That's, I think, is very good experience for me. And one last thing before I conclude my talk is about communication. Nowadays, how many emails do we receive? Plenty. It used to be emails were the innovative way to communicate with people. Nowadays, no. So find one way, something that you can communicate and reach with your students, and the students can reach with you. And you don't waste too much time. If you open your mailbox and then you are from first to the 50th, there is no time to work. You should find a way to communicate. What I do, I use WhatsApp or text. I say, I, they have, you know, we have a group with all my students and graduates, alumni. It's called Darsim. And when there is something to discuss, or they just drop a message. Hey, did you check that paper? Have you done this? Have you, there is no kind, dear Hadi, I wish that you are having a good day. And, you know. Check that paper, it's late, it's getting late, and so but that's fine. So you can find better ways to communicate. I put most of what I said here in two pages article, but as I said, offering a course is not enough, writing an article is not enough. This article is only printed in hard copy, and there is a limited number of the hard copies that is there, so then I'm trying to find a way to just send it off. If you wanted to read it, uh, please let uh, Eureka know. She has the electronic copy or, or scan of it. She can uh, share with you. But this is mostly what I just said is about that. So let me finish my, my talk by, by summarizing that to me, education is to become, not to learn, not to gain things. And only in an environment we become, we develop, and we grow. And I think we should spend a lot of time to build the happy, healthy, and professional environment around us so to make our students develop. And last but not least, it should be authentic. It should be your way. I do it this way. I might have just done it the way that it's within my capacity. You can do it a lot better. You can do it differently. If there is already an environment but there are missing components there, you can just contribute and just complement it. So that's very important. So the purpose at the end is, if we license at TU Delft, which is selected as one of the best universities just yesterday in the QS ranking, so we are very proud of it. So um, if we license someone that now you are graduate here, that person should feel that he or she is right to pick up a position in the society, whether it is in government, policy making, or industry, or academics, or whatever else it is. That's the purpose. The course is not the purpose. To become is the purpose. So at the end, I hope that I conveyed this message that for education, I think you should focus on the tree. That stays long. That will be productive for life, but not just giving students with basket of apples that can hold just maybe a week. That's not lifelong learning. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for this, I would nearly say, poetic talk. <laughs> Are there some questions? I know people have, will have to leave. Of course, the only reason you might have to leave is when you have education duty. No, but feel Ruth, free to leave the room. Yes, there is a, a question. <laughs> yes, thanks, uh, sure. Hadi, for a very uh, interesting and inspiring talk, actually. I was wondering, how you, you said uh, towards the end that we should look for, for a way to do things and not for the thousand ways you can't do it. And, Perhaps I recognize there a little bit that you spent part of your career in the States where typically they have more of a can-do mentality, I think, than, than we have. But you, I know you also uh, worked at several other places. That's right. Is, is our uh, hesitation often with things or looking for, for things that, 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 that could, could uh, cause barriers? Um, is, that, is that more common? I mean, for example, oh, in Switzerland and Iran, yes. uh, are they more there like, like the Netherlands and are the U.S. more the exception with, with a very positive view or, or how is that international? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, uh, one thing that I have observed, uh, thanks Ruth for, for asking this question, 
is that, well, I have worked and uh, lived in different places. I've, before coming here, I was at Stanford University. I worked for Chevron. I've worked at ETH Zurich and many other places as well. And when one thing that is natural is when you change place, you notice things that are just doesn't make sense. And there are many things that do make sense as well, and you appreciate them as well. There is a, a part of this is that absolutely this community build up if I am very uh, honest with you, is that I felt this very much at Stanford. This, you know, when I was seeing the difference between other universities and why Stanford was a Stanford when I was there, was that the network of the people and the community that we had. The courses were exactly the same course as, uh, as we are teaching here. Textbooks are the same. So I thought that Delft community is also very strong and is very good. There are so many things at Delft that you, we appreciate a lot, but there are things that you would feel that we could have done it differently. And there are many people like yourself that are you know, open and when you speak, they, are, they tend to listen. And it's very much personal if you like to learn, oh, that's it. So the connection with the industry and network and selling your students to get good jobs starts from university. You bring uh, industrial leaders to your classroom so they shop for the best students. These are the things that you learn when you are there and you experience. At Delft, I have experienced a lot of fascinating also examples here. So I think changing places helps a lot. And you will see that some people, individuals, are open to change, and some individuals are just not open to change. And I don't think there is a pattern here, honestly. After six years, I see that there are so many people who change things, develop new things, and some people maybe even at the best universities like Delft, they may just don't want to change. They think that what we have is already fine. They don't feel that we could have been better or what else we could have done. Absolutely. So well, thanks very much, Ruth, for this question. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Um, thank you for uh, the lot of wisdom that was in your talk. Um, I, I'm curious about the grants that you discussed yes. to get. Uh, like, how much does it... I, I really like this idea of setting up your own community. I'm sure. kind of... Uh, in my tenure track at the moment. Sure. So I, I'm sure. like, how much does it cost and what are the sources for these it, kind of grants? It, it sometimes does not cost much. You know, I just invite, you know, I invited once, you know, the, for the, you know, it depends. For the grants that we get for offering for a PhD, we cost a lot of money. You're talking about maybe about 400,000 or so. That's the range. And you spend some uh, uh, budget for attending conferences, but this can be used for just hosting one great scientist who would be very inspirational for you and for your students with a few thousand euros that we are talking. Sometimes even I brought some colleague from Princeton here and I offered him just, I, let me just uh, reimburse. He said, no, I have enough money. I just wanted to come. So you think that when you reach people, it's not, finance is not the stopper, but it's great to have it. it just, it's great to have pocket money, but you may not even end up using it. Because people know that you have the money, but your interest to, to communicate with them is because of your top science. Because you are also attractive to them. So for that, you need to work hard. But for example, I, I have a grant right now being, I, I need to be at right now in my office and, and practice for my exam next month for the uh, proposal I have. But the thing is, I have also put very, now this time with the NVO proposal, I wrote a column, I would like to do this part, which is purely educational. And nobody in the review committee said anything bad. Instead, they actually appreciated this. So I'm asking for this much money, but a couple of thousand euros for because I would like to improve my education. And that's possible, and people appreciate that. That's my personal observation. It's not much. It's not much. So a couple of thousand, I would say. Thank you. Hadi, <coughs> excuse me. We, uh, your, your talk, talk, I think, shows some really nice ways that we can get students interested, get them intrigued, get them focused less on the apple. We, there is a fundamental challenge, which is, I think, basically our examination system hmm. tests the apples. And, and that then it naturally leads to, if we continue the analogy, it naturally leads to a system where the students are optimizing the apples. What can I, you know, I mean, you mentioned a few weeks. Well, a few weeks is about a quarter. You know, what, what can I do so that on that day of the exam, I'm, I'm ready? Uh, so do you have any ideas on uh, adaptations we could make to our this exams a, that might be more idea. testing or encouraging the development of the tree? 
Well, Bill, you, you got the best lecture award some years back, so you should also partly know this. You know, this is, uh, this is an excellent comment. The thing is, when you are dealing with a system that has nothing better for now, you know, like what we say about democracy is not the best thing, but that's what we know at the best for now, the best solution for now. So the way that we are grading our students, of course, may not appreciate the way that you want to just stay out of the box and do fun with the students. What you want in here is students should pass their courses, but they should learn that their, their life is about what they become at the end. They practice a lot on how to present, how to talk, how to communicate, and nothing is graded based on that in their, for example, course on fluid physics, for example. But this means that these are one of those hundred ways that things cannot be done. How could you make your students interested in doing that? Is when you talk to them, I have had this experience, that when you see that you, they see that you have observed them and their passion and what they want to become, they are with you. They know that they should pass this course, but they know if they want to do PhD, for example, at TU Delft or MIT or Princeton, and it can be, it, it, it happens, it can be done this way, this is what we do. So it's like also tenure trackers, a friend of us, just a colleague just mentioned about the tenure trackers as well. Tenure trackers are also asked, even we as faculty, asked to do some stuff and we are measured by VLC criterion, based on some solid criterion. But one, we can just say, okay, this is, I can do that, and what else I can do? What is the fun about my work that I always say to students, if it's Monday morning and you're happy to come to work, it means we are doing things right. You know, that, that's the way, it's Monday motivator. The why, what makes you come to university? I think this is something that is absolutely right, not measurable all the time, not appreciative. If you spend a lot of time, you asked about it also, uh, about organizing a, a seminar or an event. It costs 200 emails to bring 20 people here who are so busy and have a scrambled the schedule. And nobody's going to th come and thank you for doing things or promote you or doing things. It's, it should just come from you. You should enjoy doing this. And the students, what I have seen is that they enjoy a lot when they are given a task and they are feeling they are professionals and they are leading their own education. Irrespective of if they are graded or, you know, things like that. I think it, it can happen this way. But, yeah. More questions? Okay. Well, um, uh, maybe it's a good idea then to organize a workshop, maybe with the working title uh, w to find one way to do something, but maybe <laughs> 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 people might be interested uh, in joining you. Will you be of willing course, to do of that? Course. Okay, so my pleasure, of course. Let's of course. Try to, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So I'd be pleased uh, uh, if there is any follow-up or anything, especially that uh, junior trend trackers, they want to establish an event or they want to know how the procedure was, I can just share my experience with you. Or if you want to come up with some experience of science in your courses, if this is numerical or physics-based or so, we can just share experiences. Absolutely. I mean, this sharing and this feeling that we belong to each other, you know, to one club and we complement. I, yes, I, I, but teaching academy is also a community, so Absolutely. let's Absolutely. join. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much course, again for pleasure. the talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks. And see you soon, and next time, or next week. Very good. <laughs>